Once they were ready, the crew members waved goodbye at the pad, made their way up the stairs, and got ready to board the elevator to the ride uh, to the top of the Soyuz rocket in order to board their capsule. So, raise, your, raise your right hand and wave, and wave. There we go. Yep. Three crew members loading into that elevator for the ride to the top of the Soyuz rocket in order to board their capsule. As of right now, they've been on board for about an hour and a half. Uh, the Soyuz rocket itself, billowing oxygen, as you can see, uh, was fueled about three hours prior to the launch. And at this point, the crew members again on board their Soyuz strapped in and everything continuing to march and count down uh, towards today's launch. Today's launch will mark the 10th time that a Soyuz vehicle is scheduled to dock to the orbiting complex on the same day, docking only four orbits or about six hours after today's launch. Just two minutes and 56 seconds before the launch, however, the International Space Station will fly directly over the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. And at the time of the launch, the uh, International Space Station will be flying at an altitude of about 252 statute miles over northeast Kazakhstan. Launch is precisely timed for the moment when the Earth's rotation will place Baikonur in the plane of the orbit of the International Space Station. At the time of the Soyuz spacecraft's orbital insertion, at about 8 minutes and 45 seconds after the launch, uh, the space station will be roughly 1,983 statute miles ahead as, they, as the rendezvous begins. The planned six-hour rendezvous will culminate with docking to the uh, space station's Rosviet module at 11.24 a.m. Central Time, 11.24 p.m. in Baikonur, uh, where Russian, American, and European dignitaries, guests, and family will be watching uh, the events unfold on television. And, uh, should a problem occur, though, in the first two and a half hours of the flight, the Soyuz vehicle and its crew can default to a two-day rendezvous, uh, and that docking time would occur in the early morning hours central time on December 17th. But everything continuing to march ahead for the launch of Tim Kopra, Yuri Malenchenko, and Tim Peake to the International Space Station today. Uh, the launch pad service structure components have been lowered, as you can see, and the clamshell gantry service towers have been retracted in preparation for liftoff. Suit leak checks at this point uh, already underway, and the emergency escape system uh, was armed uh, just about a minute or two ago. The escape tower uh, on the very top of the rocket would fire in the event of a problem during the launch. Uh, this system designed to pull the spacecraft and the crew clear of the booster, enabling the Soyuz capsule to parachute to a safe landing in the event of an emergency during the launch or the early stages of the climb to orbit. But right now atop uh, and within the Soyuz TMA-19M spacecraft, Tim Cobra, Yuri Malenchenko, and Tim Peak, just 32 minutes, 25 seconds and counting from launch. The uh, whole Soyuz spacecraft is 23 and a half feet long and weighs in at 15,650 pounds and is comprised of three separate modules. Uh, starting off with the descent module, which is situated in the middle of the Soyuz vehicle, which contains customized seats for the crew members during uh, the launch, entry, and landing phases. It contains all of the controls and displays necessary for the flight. It also contains life support systems, batteries for the re-entry and landing, and the parachutes and the soft uh, landing rocket engines to slow the Soyuz just before a touchdown uh, when the Soyuz lands in Kazakhstan. There are eight hydrogen peroxide thrusters located on the module, and they are used to uh, control the spacecraft's orientation or its attitude during the descent until parachute deployment. It also has a guidance, navigation, and control system uh, to maneuver the vehicle during the descent phase of the mission. The descent module weighs in at 6,393 pounds with a habitable volume of 141 cubic feet. 
Approximately 110 pounds of payload can be returned to Earth in this module, and the descent module is, of course, the only portion of the Soyuz that survives its return to Earth. Then up on top, the orbital module connects the descent module via uh, a pressurized hatch. It's where the crew has a small amount of room to move around during the flight to the station. It has a volume of 230 cubic feet with the docking mechanism, hatch, and rendezvous antenna located at the very front end. The docking mechanism used to dock with the space station. The hatch allows entry into the orbiting complex. The rendezvous antennas are used by the automated docking system, uh, which uses radar to maneuver towards the station for docking. There's also a forward-looking window in the module that the crew can use in order to take manual measurements of distance and closing speed with a laser range finder in the event of a uh, failure of that automated rendezvous radar system. In the final piece, the propulsion module uh, houses the oxygen storage tanks, the main engine, the attitude control thrusters, avionics, and communications and control equipment. Uh, the propulsion module uh, handles all orbital maneuvers, including those needed for the rendezvous with the International Space Station and the deorbit burn at the end of the spacecraft's mission. And then uh, before they get deployed, the two solar arrays are folded against the body of the propulsion module, uh, which separates from the descent module after a deorbit burn, uh, along with the orbital module. Uh, those solar panels spanning about 35 feet in length. The entire spacecraft serving not only as a crew transport vehicle to and from the International Space Station, uh, but also as an emergency return vehicle, uh, you could call it an escape pod almost, in the event uh, the crew should have to leave the station unexpectedly. But continuing to get live feeds from the launch pad down there in Baikonur right now, uh, under 30 minutes. We're 29 minutes, 20 seconds and counting uh, before the liftoff still scheduled at 5.03 a.m. Central Time, 6.03 a.m. Eastern, 5.03 p.m. in the uh, early evening over there in Baikonur. group of NASA representatives uh, is there on site in Baikonur, just a short distance away from the launch. For a quick update on activities there, let's go now to NASA Public Affairs Officer Rob Navius. Dan, the Union Jack is in prominent display here at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, Great Britain's Tim Pika Center Stage, and all is in readiness for this pre-sunset launch. A huge throng of guests and VIPs are on hand. NASA is represented by Bill Gerstenmeyer, the Associate Administrator for Human Exploration Operations, and Kirk Shireman, the recently named ISS Program Manager. The European Space Agency's Director General, Jan Werner, and the Chief Executive of the British Space Agency, David Parker, are also here, ready to cheer on Peak as he begins his journey. Once on board the station, Peak is expected to receive written communications of congratulations from Queen Elizabeth, and other British dignitaries as he settles into his new home in space. Today is the 50th anniversary of the first rendezvous in space, Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 flying within a foot of each other in an historic milestone. Today, the Soyuz and its crew are poised to set off for a rendezvous and docking to a mammoth complex in orbit. How far we've come in a half century. That's it from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Now back to you at Mission Control in Houston. And continuing to get that live view of the Soyuz on the pad in Baikonur. Again, uh, 27 minutes, 25 seconds away from liftoff. Uh, still scheduled at 5.03 a.m. Central Time, 6.03 a.m. Eastern, 5.03 p.m. over in Baikonur. So each of the three crew members launching tonight to the International Space Station each hails from uh, a space agency of a different nation and is a reflection of the spirit and international cooperation that has brought the world's most complex spacecraft together as a 21st century scientific marvel. Uh, the international partnership of space agencies from the United States, Russia, Europe, Japan, and Canada have worked together for 15 years and counting on the most politically complex space exploration program ever undertaken.
It took 41 rocket launches just to bring the building materials to the construction site, and more than 100 other launches along the way to ferry up the human crew members and deliver the supplies they would need to live and work. The largest peacetime engineering and construction project in human history. And it wouldn't have happened if the nations of the world hadn't joined forces. But they did. And that cooperative spirit is alive and thriving right now on board the International Space Station. Space agencies of the world each have their own independent exploration program. Yet they work together on one project that's vital to humankind's future in space. Operating a joint research laboratory and technology development station 250 miles above the Earth. The United States, Russia, Japan, Canada, and the nations of Europe each provide and train crew members who operate this space station. We have uh, come to know each other very well, to really um, enjoy each other's company, enjoy working together. Uh, I consider them very close friends. При нашем взаимодействии внутри корабля, вот мы отталкиваемся прежде всего от целей и задач. Почему именно мы сидим в этом корабле? И поэтому у нас никаких особых проблем в взаимодействии никаких нет. Сил нашей профессиональной способности. I think each country has its, uh, its unique like uh, strengths and good part and also uh, like a weakness. So if we cooperate each other, we can cover the, uh, other nations' weak part and help each other. Over the years, the partners have contributed the vehicles that bring human beings to orbit and the ones that make regular deliveries of supplies and materials, plus all the hardware and samples to operate a set of scientific laboratories and experiments that are achieving things that couldn't be done on Earth. The results, in terms of science and technology development, are out of this world. Having different perspectives, either different scientific perspectives, different international perspectives, has helped bring strength to the work that we do. We've gotten to work with some incredible people around the globe, and that, that we found what we think are some significant findings. The Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer is a high-energy particle physics experiment designed to study cosmic rays, antimatter, dark matter, and dark energy. There is 15 countries, about 600 engineers, physicists, scientists, technicians, about 60 different institutes universities all over the planet. You get the interaction of all these people and in the end you have something that's a whole lot better than what you have done by yourself. Each space agency takes responsibility for a part of the mission by operating a control room in their own country, which focuses on daily operations in their own labs and modules. The heart of the overall operation is at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, where a team coordinates what all the partners are doing. The Yasa Plan team takes all of the requirements handed down from the ISS program, from the international partners, from the flight control team, and from the science community. And we integrate all of those requirements into a timeline, and we uplink it to the crew, and that's how the crew knows what to do on a given day. With all that effort, over all these years, the partners in the International Space Station have created something that's already provided benefits on Earth and encourage the growth of a commercial space industry and is perfectly positioned to continue that mission, supporting future human exploration into deep space. If you think about all the capability that's on the space station today, it brought out the best in each of the partners. The only way for exploration to be successful is to have that global partnership together as we have had so far with space station. We're gonna use the technology of the ATV five very successful ISS resupply missions to make this incredible contribution to the Orion spacecraft. So the service module will be a, a very critical part to the Orion spacecraft. It will provide power, it will provide thermal control, and most importantly, it will provide propulsion to the crew module. Building on the robotic technology we developed to support the space shuttle program and then to build, to assemble the space station, Canada's developed a next generation Canadarm. 
This is a state-of-the-art suite of robotics prototypes that will be able to support the critical next steps in exploring the solar system. У нас в России есть такая поговорка, что один ум хорошо, а два еще лучше. Но две и три это гораздо лучше, потому что работая в кооперации международной, люди гораздо лучше начинают понимать друг друга. Better understanding and a common goal combine for a great future out there. And back now with a live view of the Soyuz on the launch pad in Baikonur. We are now 20 minutes, 43 seconds in counting before liftoff, which is scheduled at 5.03 a.m. Central, 6.03 a.m. Eastern, 5.03 p.m. in the evening over in Baikonur. NASA astronaut Tim Coper has been in training for uh, more than two years for this, uh, his second space flight and uh, second long duration stay on board the International Space Station. Uh, but this is going to be his first trip aboard a Soyuz. Two weeks ago, we had a chance to talk with him while he was still in Star City, Russia, talking about his training and level of preparedness for his upcoming mission. We are 100% ready. We've spent a lot of time getting ready for this mission, and uh, and frankly, there's the two, two and a half years of training for this mission, but uh, there's lots of training that we do even before this in terms of space station systems, learning how to do spacewalks and do the robotics operations, so it's a culmination of a lot of hard work. Was it much different from the training for your first flight to station? It's quite a bit different. You know, um, in lots of respects. One is that uh, over time we've gotten much, much better in uh, training uh, crew members for space station in every respect in terms of the systems on board and finding the right level of training that we need, but uh, also in terms of how efficient and how effective we are in training for the emergencies that could happen on board. We've done a great job of that. That's a big difference. The second big difference is the fact that uh, we're going up and down on Soyuz now. And last time I was a space station crew member while I was on board and was trained for uh, emergency descent, whereas this time we go up and down. I have a very active role as the left seater in the Soyuz, and so I've spent probably half of my time here over the last couple of years uh, being able to, to work closely with uh, Yuri Malenchenko and Tim Peake as uh, the left seater, and uh, it's much different. It's a much higher bar in terms of the expectations, but, uh, but we're ready. I was going to ask whether or not you're excited about having a, a different ride to the station this time. I am really excited. You know, I, I truly respect the Soyuz space vehicle. It's, it is a very safe vehicle. It protects us through the entire flight envelope, and it hasn't always been that way. It's not the way the shuttle was. You know, we know that uh, even if we have anomalies going uphill to space station, that we'll be in a, a safe place. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty exciting thing. Talk me through what happens then on, on Soyuz launch day. What is it like for you and Yuri and Tim on that day? It's a very methodical approach, and um, the Russian Space Agency has been doing this for a very long time, and uh, we experience this as the backup crew, watching the prime crew go through the flow all the way up into getting to the vehicle and then launching. And so, having watched that, essentially, it's like being a dress rehearsal for us, having gone through the backup flow. And what that entails is, on the day of launch, uh, they wake us up, you have a breakfast, you go to a suit-up room, you make sure that your suit is pressure tight, you get into the vehicle, you do your preparational checks, they close the hatch, and then you launch. And so um, it's nice having gone through that, and uh, it's very methodical and well thought out, plenty of time, and uh, we'll be looking forward to that that uh, ignition. As you uh, look ahead to, to your time on orbit, uh, is there anything special you're looking forward to, uh, spacewalks or uh, particular experiments or whatnot? You know, uh, we may do some spacewalks on board. Uh, you never 100% know until you get there because uh, there's lots of 
dynamics with uh, human spaceflight. There's different cargo vehicles come up and uh, equipment on board that's outside tends to break on occasion that needs to get repaired. If we have the opportunity to do a spacewalk, I think it's uh, icing on the cake for a mission. Uh, but you know, our primary job, in addition to that maintenance, is to be the scientist on board. We're a scientist, we're a lab technician, and sometimes we're the, the experiment. And uh, I think uh, all of us feel very honored to be able to participate in that. Are you planning to uh, to to share the mission on social media channels that that some crewmates have been using? Absolutely. I look forward to be able to send uh, my best pictures down on Twitter, and uh, I hope uh, that I get better and better with my photography, and so I can really send some great photos. It's a uh, it's not just a. Uh, uh, an honor, but maybe even a responsibility, I think, to share our experience on board. And uh, I noticed last time, uh, I like taking uh, pictures before, I like photography, but I became quite the enthusiast because uh, the subject matter is just tremendous, both the internal portion of the space station, but also our beautiful planet. And so I look forward to taking those pictures and sending them down. You're going to be seven months or more uh, before you get back home here to Houston uh, by the time you finish this mission. Uh, tell me why what we're doing on this space station is worth making that kind of sacrifice. You know, frankly, I wouldn't consider our time on board a sacrifice. I really consider it a privilege because all of us are very, very passionate about human spaceflight. And uh, to be able to participate and actually be actively involved in it in this capacity is just a tremendous honor. In terms of what we're benefiting from uh, the space station, the space station now is an orbiting laboratory and it is fully engaged. And there are several different areas in which we're learning uh, very, very important things. The one that's closest uh, to my heart is learning what it takes for us to expand our ability to, to be in space. And so we're learning about what zero gravity does to the human body, and it's very, very important science. Also, space station itself, in my opinion, is an experiment onto itself because we're learning about the systems that are on board uh, that are required to, to both uh, work and live in space, and that's very, very important. And then lastly, there's a tremendous level of uh, benefit from the basic research that we're doing on board. There are certain areas, especially in the area of biology, that uh, is different in zero gravity, and we can learn a tremendous amount from this laboratory. Also, there's uh, combustion science and fluid flow. These are basic science areas in which we're going to improve our knowledge base, and they'll have benefits to us here on planet Earth someday. Tim, thanks for the talk. Uh, have a safe trip, and, and have a good time on orbit. I will. Thanks, Pat. And back now with that live view of the Soyuz rocket on the pad there in Baikonur. Right now we're 13 minutes, 30 seconds away from launch. Liftoff scheduled at 5.03 a.m. Central Time, 6.03 a.m. Eastern. It'll be 5.03 in the afternoon out there in chilly Baikonur. Temperatures hovering right around freezing uh, for those uh, watching from the Kazakh step today. But everything continuing to go smoothly with the rocket. All the pre-launch preparations uh, should be wrapping up uh, within the next uh, six or seven minutes. Uh, the vehicle gyroscopes and all of the onboard flight data recorders will soon be activated. And then shortly after that, all of those pre-launch preparations will be complete. The Soyuz will be ready to lift off. So as we just heard Tim Coper speak about uh, very briefly, uh, the International Space Station, of course, a one-of-a-kind laboratory in Earth orbit, uh, conducting hundreds of experiments. Uh, Tim Coper and his crew will be involved in uh, 250 or more experiments during their six or seven months on board the International Space Station, one-of-a-kind microgravity laboratory uh, with investigations not only expanding our presence in space and getting us ready for the ready for the journey to Mars, but also providing some benefits back down to light here on Earth. Why don't we take a look now um, at and go inside the technological marvel that is the International Space Station, humanity's home and a laboratory in orbit since 1998. It's a big, beautiful blue planet, and the adventurous natives have been exploring it all over from the very beginning. Lately, they've been exploring off the planet, 
determined to discover what's out there. But as luck would have it, their pursuit of their future has also been building their present. They're enjoying benefits today that are coming out of the work about tomorrow. Work that's being done right now aboard the International Space Station. Since Expedition 1 arrived on orbit in the year 2000, there have been more than 1,500 investigations active on the International Space Station in fields like medicine, medicine uh, protein crystal growth, uh, combustion, metallurgy, basic science, space science, uh, Earth observation for uh, disaster recovery and, uh, and relief. And many of those experiments and research projects have produced beyond the original intent. For example, a lot of the work in medicine was designed to keep astronauts safe in space, such as research on how to keep crew members from losing bone mass and weightlessness. And the researchers found that nutrition was playing a part. The individuals had more iron storage in their body, um, had more oxidative damage, and had more bone loss in certain regions. So, more attention was paid to providing foods with the right kinds of minerals and nutrients. Then, there was better exercise support, like an upgraded exercise device that proved its effectiveness in crew members who flew with it after having flown without it. For the first flight, I lost 99% of bone loss. Uh, after the second flight, during all those prescriptions and exercises that I was, I've been told to do uh, from bone loss uh, perspective, I lost nothing. The right combination of exercise and diet and vitamin D supplements meant no bone loss. So there's been a huge development of our understanding of bone processes, why astronauts are losing bone, and how the bone re remodels and recycles itself. Understanding that process helps us protect astronauts, but it also has the benefit of giving new insights into understanding those same processes on Earth, where so many people are worried about bone loss. Another example of station research providing a benefit on the ground? Water reclamation. Early on, the station crew members relied on space shuttles and other cargo ships to deliver fresh water. But the long-range plan was for a more self-sufficient station with a system that turns wastewater into pure drinking water. On board the space station, we've had a water recovery system in use since 2008. This system recovers 90% of the water that we fly to the space station. This technology will be vital for our long duration missions. And that's because on a deep space mission, the water resupply won't be practical. And where else do you think this technology is proving useful? The water treatment system that we developed for the space station is, has been deployed over the last 10 years now all over the world. When you get involved with a plant of this kind, if it is well used, it can change the lives of an entire community. It gives you children that learn more, it gives you parents who spend less money on medicine, it changes the future. And then, there's space station activity that was designed to benefit people on Earth. For example, students on Earth, from grade schoolers through postdocs. Since the beginning, Station crew members have used an amateur radio to talk directly with students on the ground, answering questions and inspiring some of them to careers in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. More than half a million students have learned about geography, and teamwork, and communications, and problem solving by participating in an experiment that lets them control a camera on the station and aim it at targets on the Earth of their own choosing. The SPHERES experiments originated to test algorithms related to formation flying, but it's evolved to include students in the design and execution of those robotic flights. The International Space Station has a lot of goals. Not only is it getting people of this planet to work together and enabling deep space missions of the future and seeding the growth of commercial space ventures, it has an ambitious agenda of laboratory science and technology research that's using the unique environment of low Earth orbit to learn what can't be learned here on the ground to help people on the planet right now.
And welcome back to our live view of the Soyuz rocket on the pad, under six and a half minutes away from launch. Just six minutes, 20 seconds in counting until today's launch scheduled at 5.03 a.m. Central Time, 6.03 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, here a view inside of the capsule you can see hanging down in front of uh, the Soyuz commanders today Yuri uh, Malenchenko uh, the uh, medallion uh, and the small toy rocket uh, which will be used during the ascent um, to uh, eventually signify when the crew is in orbit you'll see it start to float signifying that they are in microgravity uh, the talisman uh, the small medallion and the toy rocket commemor commemorating the 55th anniversary of Yuri Yarin's launch back on April 12th 1961 when he became the first human in space. So as we come up on 5 minutes and 30 seconds launch control uh, will uh, give a report on the range uh, in Baikonur whether or not it's clear and uh, when the Soyuz rocket is ready to begin its journey. At this point, uh, the launch key uh, should have already been inserted as well inside the launch bunker. And yes, they do use a real key, uh, which is able to transition the launch sequence into its automatic mode. But the sky looking clear, the weather crystal clear, although a bit chilly down there in Baikonur, as we approach now just five minutes away from launch. Now you hear the call, launch key has been inserted. Again, today's mission launching under the call sign Agat, which is the Russian word for a lustrous gemstone. That's the same call sign that uh, Yuri Malenchenko used on his previous five journeys into space, making his sixth journey today alongside Tim Copra. It's going to be a second time space flyer and Timothy Peake uh, just off screen here uh, from Great Britain. He's going to be making his first trip into space. It will be the 221st individual to launch and visit the International Space Station. Run one. Chamber perch. So under four minutes to go at this point, onboard system switching over to onboard control. Uh, the commander's uh, cockpit displays and controls have all been activated. And Malenchko will be the Soyuz commander for uh, this trip towards the International Space Station today. The crew members with their helmets closed, uh, putting them on their internal suit oxygen. And then uh, shortly before liftoff, the fuel lines and other elements of the rocket uh, and the rocket engines are purged with nitrogen to fireproof them, removing all of the excess vapors uh, of fuel and oxidizer. Run two. Uh, and we are now at three minutes and counting. Two minutes and 45 seconds, the booster tank being pressurized for flight. This, uh, of course, helping to optimize the flow of fuel and helps to add structural support to the rocket itself. Once those engines ignite, you'll see them fire for a number of seconds uh, as they ramp up their thrust. Once the uh, thrust is powerful enough, the Soyuz will be able to basically leap free of the uh, constraints currently holding it uh, in position there on the launch pad. And the Soyuz will begin its uh, 8 minute 45 second flight into orbit. And T minus 2 minutes and counting. And 
And one minute, 30 seconds and counting shortly. The ground propellant feed will be terminated to the rocket. Everything continuing to go smoothly with the countdown on track for this launch uh, just under one minute and 20 seconds away from now. T-minus one minute and counting. The Soyuz now on internal power and we have auto sequence start. to internal power. So at T minus 35 seconds, the first umbilical tower has separated from the booster. That second tower will go at about 15 seconds away from launch. We're at 24 and counting now. The ground umbilical to the third stage has been disconnected. Auto sequence initiated. Second umbilical tower now separating. Boosters igniting, the engines firing. Ramping up to flight speed. And liftoff. Liftoff of Tim Copra, Yuri Malenchenko, and Timothy Peak on their way to the International Space Station. So far, getting good first stage performance. The Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust from its four boosters and single core engine. The first stage of the Soyuz, 68 feet in length, 24 feet in diameter. It's gonna be burning liquid fuel for the first two minutes and six seconds of the flight. We'll be getting regular Launch performance calls from the uh, engineers out there at the launch pad in Baikonur. 48 seconds and counting after launch. Everything continuing to go well with the first stage of the Soyuz rocket. Yeah, we're receiving data. Chamber pressure nominal. Thirty sixty seconds. Pitch. Now one minute and ten seconds into the flight, the Soyuz rocket already traveling at a velocity of 1,100 miles per hour. On board Malenchenko, Koper, and Peak, uh, one minute and 22 seconds into their planned eight minute 45 flight into orbit. Everything continuing to go well with the first stage, the four strap-on boosters, and the core engine performing nominally or normally. 90 seconds, engine stable. And just there we see the four strap-on boosters jettison the first stage uh, and the boot strap-on boosters completing their job, dropping away at an altitude of 28 statute miles. At this point, the Soyuz is traveling at about 3,350 miles per hour. You can see the four strap-on boosters uh, all separated from the Soyuz successfully, that core stage continuing to fire. Second stage will continue until about four minutes, 43 seconds into the flight, at which point it will shut down shortly after the third stage ignites. And then uh, shortly we should get confirmation that the launch shroud has been jettisoned. We can see that the bearing has been jettisoned. And confirm the launch shroud uh, protecting the Soyuz during the initial ascent has been jettisoned. The rocket now at an altitude of over 48 miles in height. R13. Copy. We can see that. On board, everything continuing to go well. You can see British astronaut Tim Peake there uh, over in the right seat in the center. Soyuz commander Yuri Malenchenko. Everything going well for the Soyuz craft as it continues its climb. The Soyuz already traveling at a speed of over 4,700 miles an hour. 
the thumbs up from Peak there and a quick wave. The Soyuz core stage uh, continuing to perform as expected. Uh, the core stage of the Soyuz rocket is uh, 56 feet in length, 13 and a half in diameter, with a single engine and four fuel chambers providing between 178,000 and 222,000 pounds of thrust for its three minutes and 28 seconds of operation. So again, this stage is going to continue to burn until the 4 minute 43 second mark. The Soyuz then uses what's called a hot stage technique. Uh, the third stage will ignite while the second still burning. Uh, this is why you, if you ever look at a Soyuz, it has the small open area between the second and third stages. Copy, I got, I got it. So in just about 10 seconds, we'll be standing by for the third stage to ignite and the second stage to shut down. Two ninety seconds. Third stage activation confirmed. I got the two minutes. And second stage separation confirmed. Third stage now igniting. The core booster separating at an altitude of 105 statute miles. Soyuz craft now being propelled by the single engine of the Soyuz's third stage. The engine provides 67,000 pounds of thrust and will burn for four minutes and two seconds. 320 seconds. Flight number. Copy. And this right here, actually a, uh, a view from the International Space Station, getting an unprecedented view of the Soyuz as it makes its flight into orbit. Copy. Currently six minutes since, since liftoff. Copra, Malenchenko, and Peak inside the Soyuz currently traveling on top of the third stage, which again uh, burns for a total of four minutes and two seconds. Three hundred and eighty seconds. Stage three engine is stable. Copy. The third stage will continue burning for about another two minutes or so. Uh, until it cuts off and separates and then places the Soyuz craft into its preliminary orbit. Four hundred and ten seconds nominal. Copy Agate. Forty seconds. Attitude stable. Copy. So coming up on seven minutes thirty seconds post launch, the vehicle's velocity now at almost thirteen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Once the third stage delivers the Soyuz into orbit, uh, the module gets separated. A series of uh, pre-programmed commands will execute in order to prepare the Soyuz for orbital operations. All these stored commands, uh, called time-tagged commands, allow many of the Soyuz's systems to be automatically activated by onboard computers at very precise times stored inside of those computers. Again, over eight minutes now since liftoff, about 45 seconds remaining on the third stage operations. Once that's finished, they'll be in their preliminary orbit, and the uh, vehicle will uh, command the deployment of antennas and the solar array, and will be in an, uh, its initial altitude. Again, everything continuing to go well with all three stages of the rocket today. All nominal. Copy. 
510 seconds. Uh, pitch your and roll nominal. Now standing by for third stage cutoff and separation. You can uh, see the small jolt there for the crew members as the third stage cuts off and separates. Uh, the single liquid fueled engine shut down and dropping away at an altitude of about 125 statute miles. Uh, the third stage performs an avoidance maneuver by opening a valve in its liquid oxygen tank to steer well clear of the Soyuz spacecraft. Unintelligible. And so hearing confirmation of spacecraft set, uh, the Soyuz capsule and the crew now safely in orbit, uh, executed all those pre-programmed commands, hearing uh, the deployment of antennas and solar arrays went as planned. Soyuz orbiting at an altitude of about 143 by 118 miles. This orbit's going to be raised systematically over the course of the next six hours, placing it in close proximity to the International Space Station. And control from uh, here on out will be overseen by the Russian Mission Control Center just outside of Moscow. Uh, expecting that. So again, we did get confirmation. All of the antennas and solar arrays have been deployed. Uh, the Soyuz craft now in its preliminary orbit. Yuri Malenchenko, Tim Copra, and uh, Tim Peak from the European Space Agency now in space on their way towards the International Space Station. Again, they're at their initial altitude right now of about 143 by 118 miles. That orbit going to be raised uh, with a series of burns over the next six hours uh, as they chase down uh, the International Space Station, uh, slated for a docking a little bit later this morning central time. But everything going flawlessly with the uh, liftoff, which happened right on time at 5.03 a.m. Central Time this morning, 6.03 a.m. Eastern, 5.03 p.m. over there in Baikonur. Uh, picture, copy. Getting video uh, from the command panel of the vehicle itself. Again, all this being done while the Soyuz craft is still over those Russian ground sites. Uh, it'll pass out of range uh, in just a couple of minutes. So doing all of these initial uh, power-ups and checkouts, uh, all the solar arrays and antennas reported uh, to be deployed um, without any issue. The Soyuz craft in uh, good health and already uh, in orbit. Uh, in just a couple of hours arriving at the International Space Station. So a flawless flight uh, up into orbit today. Uh, one new space flyer, uh, Tim Peake, the rookie, uh, making his first trip into space uh, alongside two veteran crew, mem crew members, Yuri Malenchenko and Tim Copra. I got it. Unintelligible. I got to this is Mission Control Moscow, ready to copy your measurements. Copy. I got two information. Uh, in the 
And so the Soyuz craft with Yuri Malenchenko, Tim Coper, and Tim Peake in its initial orbit, uh, orbiting the Earth right now at an altitude of roughly 143 miles. Uh, the Soyuz craft arriving there just about 8 minutes, 45 seconds after a successful liftoff, uh, which came at 5.03 a.m. Central Time, 6.03 a.m. Eastern Time this morning, 5.03 in the afternoon over in Baikonur. Um, the three crew members, again, in that initial orbit over the next several hours, they're going to be raising that orbit as they chase down the International Space Station and uh, get ready to dock uh, in a single day, six-hour, four-orbit rendezvous with the orbiting laboratory. A couple of programming notes for you as we uh, get ready to wrap up uh, this morning's uh, launch broadcast. Uh, immediately following this, we'll be bringing you replays of the launch from pad number one over there in Baikonur. A flawless liftoff and a clear day today uh, over on the Kazakh steppe. At 7 a.m. Central Time, we'll be bringing you our video file, our post-launch video file here on NASA TV. We will be resuming live coverage at 10.45 a.m. Central for uh, the Soyuz docking to the International Space Station. That docking slated to come at 11.24 a.m. Central. We'll again break away for a little while while the crews conduct uh, leak checks between the Soyuz and the station itself. Resuming our coverage at 1 p.m. Central Time today with the hatch opening expected to come at around 1.25. Uh, p.m. Central Time. And then uh, to wrap up the day will be a Soyuz post-docking video file showing the best views from all of the uh, activities today. That'll be at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern on NASA TV. So again, be sure to join us again. Stick around for these launch replays and we will be back when these crew members are ready to dock to the International Space Station. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, this morning's launch. Three crew members, Yuri Malenchenko, Tim Copra, and uh, the British astronaut Tim Peake now in space on their way to the International Space Station. That'll wrap it up for us here for the launch broadcast. We'll be back in a few hours. Uh, but for now, we will go ahead and sign off. This is Mission Control Houston.